Okay, let's wrap up unit four. Some of the artwork that I'm going to show you is actually in unit 10, and I, I won't dwell on it too much, but it is something that you can still speak about um, on the AP exam. Um, anything that we've covered is still fair game on your essay. Um, you're just not required to know anything from those other chapters. So let's go ahead and begin. We're going to be trying to understand installation and earth art and how it challenges the traditions of art. So I'm actually going to start us in New York City on the island of Manhattan, and we're going to be looking at Central Park. And so um, this is not in the 250, but it's probably important for you to understand that Central Park is not a natural park, to say the least. So all of the water features, all of the open land, all of the hills and so on was constructed by a landscape architect named Olmsted. He actually is the one who worked in the World um, Columbian Exhibition in Chicago as well, worked on the grounds. And so what they did is they um, leveled a bunch of homes and neighborhoods um, in the city and they constructed irrigation, some thoroughfares, some hills and, and added roads and so such um, and such to make a uh, park for those who live on the island. Um, to enjoy. So it has kind of two different sections to it. It has a more formal section by the zoo and the giant parkways and the fountains, um, these big long wide avenues, and then it has places for people to collect. Um, so large lawns for play, playing games, um, ponds, the famous boathouse, and so on. So it is a place that is ripe for um, art installations, and it itself is um, kind of artificial and um, made for personal enjoyment of the people. So we're going to look at um, Yaoyoi Kasuma. I hope I pronounced her first name first um, correctly. And um, go ahead and Google her name and see what she's known for. So she's become really popular in the last few years. Um, she's really known for her dots and so and her interesting um, story. Um, so we're going to learn a little bit more about her. Okay. So the image that's in the 250 is Narcissus's garden. Um, and so let's go ahead and break this down. Um, who is Narcissus and what is narcissism? Okay, so you probably know the story of Narcissus. Um, he kind of fell in love with his image as he was looking in um, a body of water and he kind of fell in and drowned. And so narcissism is that admiration of oneself. And so that's um, some of the core content of this piece, right? So as you look in one of these reflecting balls, what does it, what does the reflection convey as you look in it? So when you're looking at it, what do you see? Um, we have something very similar in Chicago with Anish Kapoor's cloud gate, right? Or as we often know as the bean. And when we look at it, it's a distortion of reality because it's not a flat mirrored. We see ourselves, but we also see a distorted version of ourselves. So what could that mean when it comes to this idea of narcissism, right? So a little bit of context and form. Um, does she make the globes herself, right? Initially and um, then later on, did she make these globes herself, right? Um, she did not. Her work is very similar to Donald Judd, and we looked at him last week. Um, so if you remember, Donald Judd is a minimalist artist, and so it's a movement in sculpture and painting towards abstraction, removing expression, the touch of the artist and texture. Remember that this is a revolt against abstract expressionists that's full of angst and the deep-rooted emotions of the artist. 
the artworks are factory produced. P sometimes the artist designs it, but often what the artist would do is repurpose an object um, and use it for their own purposes. So they would appropriate and, dis and change the meaning. Um, but also the work is conceptual, that the artwork is about the idea rather than the finished product or you know, the actual making of the artist. Um, so her work is similar to people like Duchamp, right? So he's in the 250. So this would be a good comparison when we talk about conceptualism, as well as artwork that is made by someone other than the artist. Um, she moved from Japan to the U.S. and um, started to um, get in touch with a lot of gallery owners and gallery um, promoters and began showing her work with a lot of those minimalist artists. Um, she was not formally invited by um, to the Venice Biennial, but one of her artist friends strongly encouraged her. So she got permission to put on the lawn at the um, Italian pavilion. Um, each nation kind of has a exhibition space. And so she was able to display uh, 1,500 of these plastic um, spheres um, on the lawn of it. And what it did is they were kind of compressed tightly. And so you could see a reflection of the surroundings of the people looking at them. Um, it created that distorted sort of reality. And she intentionally chose a sphere that was similar to the size of a crystal ball. So when one could look at it, right, the viewer could see their reflection um, and could be looking at their own vanity, right? So they could be reflecting their own vanity. They could be reflecting their own ego. Um, she made this into what we kind of call like a performance art. So performance art is where it's not just about the actual piece. There's some sort of performance element to it. There's sometimes um, a script or a flow of um, content um, that creates a story or sometimes even seems nonsensical. Um, but she placed signs and she basically said, narcissist is guard in Kasuma, and then your narcissism for sale on the lawn. And then she would act like a street peddler. And you can see that here in this bottom image. What she basically would do is offer to sell them for $2 a piece. And she'd also um, kind of hand out these uh, slips of paper that basically were um, a um, art critic talking about um, how good her work was. And so she was kind of like selling her artwork and selling her like popularity, selling, um, kind of doing some self-promotion. And so she was consciously trying to draw attention to herself. Um, she dressed in a kimono, but instead of just being a typical kimono, it was um, metallic. It had gold, it was gold, and it had a silver sash. So she was really trying to bring a lot of attention to herself. And so, um, what's the function? Why is she trying to sell her artwork, and why is she selling it so cheaply? Let's think about who can afford two dollars, right? Can pretty much anyone afford one of these plastic balls? Yeah, basically, right? So she made it cheap enough that it could be sold to anyone. Now, these first spheres were made out of plastic. Eventually, they became made out of chrome, and she sold them for a lot more, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But she was talking about kind of the selling and the production of art and the com commercialization of the art world. And so the function of this piece, this performance piece, is an idea of her self-promoting as well as her protesting the commercialization of art. And of course, if you're at the Venice Biennial, you are an artist um, who is highly revered, but also at the mercy of the galleries and the museums. And so often artists will change their ideas to be more sellable. And so... Um, that was kind of the function of this piece. Um, eventually, the biennial officials um, made her stop selling her pieces. 
right? So when we talk about the form, um, there's a lot of things that you could say in terms of the form. Um, it's an installation. She had to set up the, the site um, and organize all of the materials in the space. Um, it's site specific. She put it in a sp specific place. Um, she chose the Venice Biennial and she made um, her artwork for it. Um, it also is a performance. So here I put that performance definition for you. Um, we don't have any other performance pieces um, that we'll be talking about. Um, we do have more that we could um, if we have some more time in the next couple weeks after the test. Um, but this is usually where you have a time, a space, a performance body, or presence of a medium, and then the relationship between the performer and the audience. And then the artworks are also very minimal. Right. So let's look at installation. Most of the pieces we're going to look at today are either installation or site specific. So an installation is art that has to be installed and arranged in a place by the artist or uh, specified by the artist. So they might hire someone to actually do it. Um, it doesn't have to be site specific. Site specific works are works that only function in a specific location, and installations can be indoor or outdoor. They're often temporary, um, but they can also be permanent places. So, site specific artwork is artwork that's created for a certain place, right? Typically, the artist takes the location in account while planning and creating the artwork. So when she was coming up with the idea of Narcissus Garden, she knew she wanted to exhibit it at the Venice Biennial, and she knew that the type of people going to that exhibit were going to be wealthy and well-to-do, right? People who can afford. Um, now, this um, set of images we do not have an image from the Venice Biennial. We have an image from New York, actually Central Park, and that's why I started you there. So how does the setting and the objects reflect the story? Now, as she goes through history, the places that she has this artwork exhibited in changes. It's in New York, it's in Washington, D.C., it's in many like major cities around the world. They're typically places of power. And so when she, um, or when this piece has been exhibited in other places, um, it's no longer made out of plastic. Now it's made out of chrome and, um, or stainless steel. Um, and they're very, very expensive. And so now today, if you were to buy one from a gallery or even initially one of those plastic pieces, right, because they'd be old and very valuable, they'd be kind of an item of prestige. They'd be very, very expensive. And so now when you look at the pieces or you go to an exhibit um, that has the pieces, because they're normally in a location of power and wealth, they often represent the power that can afford art. And this idea that the art world is very much based on um, economic means and only the uber elite can afford art, right? And so um, it's not necessarily all about a social, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a social critique, but I do think um, that she knows what she's doing and the people who um, are seeing it are still talking about art as a commodity, even though it's much more expensive today, right? So is it site specific, right? If it can go from location to location, is it really site specific? I would say no, no, but also sort of, right? So you just really need a pond or reflecting pool to get across the idea. You just need a place in a wealthy city around the world, and you just need an area that has commerce. Um, because the main story here is art is a commodity, right? So it is installed in certain locations, right? Here's some examples of her work. Um, the Tate Modern has a good video with some context about her if you're interested. So if you just look up Tate Modern and then Kusuma, you'll find videos about her dot obsession her installations and her single pieces. Um, also her infinity rooms. Many of you have probably either seen or been in one of these. I know in Chicago they had um, um, 
one of these rooms on display. Um, the next artist that we have is Christo, and Christo is in Unit 10, so we'll kind of breeze through him, but he is also a site-specific artist. And so Christo and Jean-Claude um, think very carefully about the locations. Actually, the planning and the ideas of the artwork is much more important than the finished product, so the, the process is the artwork. Um, Jean-Claude actually passed away a couple of years ago, um, so Jean-Claude is actually still working, um, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But some of his early pieces were what we call fences, and so he, what he would do is he would traverse like the state of um, uh, California, and he'd go across some different landscapes with this big giant fence, and then it would end in the water. Here he's making a dam across of ravine, right? He's circling islands in pink plastic, right? Now for him, the process, or for them, the process is what the artwork is all about. And so what they do is they make drawings and specs and they um, make prints of it and then they will sell those prints to raise money for the installation and they will go through the whole process. They'll get the right permits, they'll get workers to install and all of that going to meeting, countless meetings to get permission to do these artworks is all the artwork and they're all temporary. So these things are only meant to be up on display for a short amount of time. Um, this is some umbrellas. He did some of these in Japan and in California. And sadly, I believe one of these in Japan fell over and actually killed someone. So there is some controversy with his artwork as well. He often um, wraps things. So here he's wrapped a bridge, wrapped a government building in Germany. Yes, the entire building has been wrapped. Kind of hard to get inside, right? And then the one that's in the 250 is the Gates in New York City. And it, of course, happens in Central Park. So once again, why it started with Central Park, right? So um, the process is just as important as the finished product. He planned um, by looking at how the pedestrians flow throughout the city, like what are the different paths that people take? What are the most frequently um, used paths? Um, he would fundraise and sell the plans. He'd go to those governmental meetings. And then he'd hire crews to install um, his plans. And so he would oversee the installation as well as taking apart the installation. So when you think about what a gate is, um, what is it usually used for? Right? So a gate is usually a way of walking into something. But if you are thinking about it in terms of like skiing, a gate is a path that you walk. And so here it's kind of this idea of walking through, but then it's forcing you to follow its own path. You don't have a lot of choice when it comes to walking through um, Central Park. You're kind of forced to have to walk within the path and walk within the gate. So he's kind of making a statement about how artificial Central Park actually is. It's not a natural landscape. It's not really English countryside. It's contrived. It's made up by Olmsted. Very popular, but also people thought it was very ugly. <laughs> Some people were very unhappy about it. Here you get an aerial view of how big the installation actually was. Right, um, John Stewart in The Daily Show made fun of it, and so you can watch a fun clip of that later if you choose. Right, this is actually a project that was in the making. Um, it was supposed to happen last month in April in Paris. The Arch de Triomphe was going to be wrapped, um, but now I guess that's going to be happening in 2021. This is the first project that Christo is going to do after the death of his wife. Um, this is Richard Serra, and he is a very famous sculptor um, in the United States, and this is called Tilted Arc, and this is in a federal plaza. Um, plazas are, are usually used for people to sit around and walk across, and this created a wall, and it was very, very controversial. Um, he was born 
um, very near shipyards. And so he is very much inspired by big um, ships that would cross the oceans. And so he creates these environments made of steel. So we're gonna finish up with, um, once again, installations and how they challenge um, uh, tradition. And we're gonna be focusing on earthworks. So what is an earthwork or land art, right? They are um, pieces of artwork that are outside of the gallery and they're placed in nature. Usually they have um, some sort of connection with the environment in which they, they are uh, shown. The rebelling against the limitations imposed by 20th century patrons, dealers, and art collectors. Um, you know, the idea that art has to be in a sterile room on a pedestal, you know, clean, pristine, and minimal. Um, this idea that art could be designed to be temporary, um, that no one could own it. It's much more like public artwork. Um, art could be made out of the natural material from the natural environment. Um, art could be placed in remote locations. It could be in public places. It could be in private place, places, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in New York or London or Paris or Tokyo. And it creates a dialogue between the work and the sites. Um, it creates a new environment. It transforms the existing environment, right? And typically they are minimal. Right, so that leads us to the spiral jetty in the Great Salt Lake. This is the last piece in the 250 that will be covered on the exam this year. So let's go ahead and watch the video. In 1970, Robert Smithson hired several people to help him create Spiral Jetty. We're standing right in the middle, at the edge of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. But we're not seeing this the way that it existed when Smithson first created it, where it was an intersection between the land and the very odd water of the Great Salt Lake. This is a terminal basin, a huge lake that had been largely fresh water, but there is no outlet. So the water, once it flows here from rivers and streams, collects and then simply evaporates, which means that the water is dense with minerals. And especially with salt, very much like the Dead Sea in the Middle East. And this is one of a handful of these terminal basins that exist in the world. Almost nothing can live here. There are a few fish that live at the outlet of some of the freshwater rivers. And, and there are brine shrimp and algae. In fact, there's a particular kind of algae that makes the water turn pinkish red. And that was true when Smithson created Spiral Jetty. But today, as we look out at the lake, it's blue. With help from the Dawn Gallery, which represented him, Smithson was able to bring a front loader, a dump trucks, a tractor to help move these basalt stones and sand and some soil into place. By creating a spiral, Smithson created lots of opportunities where the land and the water could meet one another. But right now, because the American West is in the midst of a drought, the water has receded and is at a great distance from this earthwork. So instead of the water filling the spaces in between the spiral, we have sand. So this was very much meant to be a work of art that changed based on natural principles. Smithson was interested in the idea of entropy, the idea of the way things break down, and his intervention in this natural landscape. It's an expression of the way in which artists have thought about the landscape for many years. We could go back to artists like Caspar David Friedrich, who thought about the overwhelming size and power of nature and the smallness of man. And that's certainly one of the themes here for me as we stand here. But we could also think about the importance of the vastness of the American landscape in 19th century American painting, or even its importance to the abstract expressionists in the 1950s. We can go even further back and look at the artwork of indigenous peoples in the Americas long before the Europeans arrived. The geoglyphs that are known as the Nazca lines in Peru in South America, or the earthworks that come out of the Fort Ancient culture in North America. 
And in fact, the very shape of spiral jetty is a form that has shown up in petroglyphs throughout the American West. And it's a form that appears in nature quite frequently. One of the anecdotes that Smithson apparently was aware of was the centuries-old idea that the Great Salt Lake contained a whirlpool that somehow connected it to the Pacific Ocean. So the idea of a spiral or whirlpool is active even in these stories that predate Smithson. But this is also a sculpture that is rooted in the 20th century in an industrial culture. 1970 was the year of the first Earth Day, and that signaled an important early moment in the environmental movement. The idea of the ruination that man was visiting on nature is clearly informing work like this. And Earth Day being this time when we reflect on environmental issues, but the relationship between the growing industrial nature of the United States and the amazingly beautiful, vast, virgin landscape that was here when Europeans arrived is a theme throughout 19th century American painting. And as we stand here, we see mountains. We see this basalt that's formed from a volcano. So we have a very powerful sense of the passage of time that I think was very interesting to Smithson. By putting art outside in the world, it becomes part of the process of nature. It can't be conserved. In 1970, this was still a radical idea, the idea of taking art off the wall bringing it outside, outside of the confines of a home or a museum. And thereby outside of the commercial, of a work that could be bought and sold. Smithson was interested in creating a porous relationship between that more controlled gallery experience and the experience of art in the world. So can a work like this also exist in Manhattan? Can it also exist in a gallery? Well, we did drive two hours from Salt Lake City. So one does have to make an intentional pilgrimage to see this. We're really in the middle of a vast, empty space in the American West. And yet this artwork was not conceived of as existing only here. There's a video, there are aerial photographs. And so like many works of art in the 1960s and 70s that were ephemeral, they exist through their documentation, although this still exists here also. And I have to say, I wouldn't feel as if I had experienced this work of art fully had I not come out here. Standing here looking at Spiral Jetty and being really aware of how different it is than when Smithson created it in 1970 really makes me think about museums as places where we entrust works of art. We lock them away from time. We conserve them and create special conditions to stop time from hurting them. But here, Smithson creates something that time is supposed to change. Museums, in a sense, try to do the impossible, which raises a really interesting question. What do we do with the significant work of art that was intended to change over time? This work of art and the land that it sits on came under the control of the DIA Art Foundation. What does an institution like DIA do with something like this? Does it try to protect it? Does it allow natural and industrial forces to play with the landscape around it? And so what DIA did is, in concert with the Getty Conservation Institute is to make the decision to regularly document this object. You mentioned this idea of entropy, which was so important to Smithson, this idea that the tendency of all things, according to the laws of physics, is to move from order to disorder, to chaos. And I think we have that sense of things coming apart here. So Smithson is imposing a geometric order into this natural landscape, into this vast space that is in the process over millions of years of disassembling. But here, more specifically, we can see the way his intervention is slowly coming apart. And I think that sense that over millions of years this will come apart makes us aware of the brevity of our own lifespans in the grandeur of time. Okay, so that had a lot in it, so I hope you took some notes. I probably should have said that before we actually watched that. So let's think about what a jetty is to begin with. I put two photos up to kind of help you there. A jetty is typically some sort of pier that you might put docks like as they like serve as a dock that you might put boats on. It also could be a water break. Um, a lot of um, uh, bays as well as lakes will put a break in so that um, the land doesn't get eroded away. So if there's big waves, it kind of breaks up the waves and protects the harbor, right? So this is a spiral version of a jetty. 
right? And so the specific location is in the Great Salt Lake. What is important to know about the Great Salt Lake? Right? What makes it different than like our Lake Michigan? Right? It has a high concentration of salt, which makes it easy to flow on. It also would make it a kind of a a important location, especially to um, indigenous people. You know, it'd be very different um, compared to a lot of fresh waterways um, that are located. So it might have some specific sort of religious significance to it as well. Um, also, it changes color. You saw that um, in the video that during the different seasons, the salt concentration and the algae will change it from green to blue to red and so on, right? So why is this curved, right? And how does it reflect the location of Utah? They also mentioned this in the video. So it represents a lot of the pictographs that come from the American Southwest, the idea of earthworks it, itself. You know, the spiral jetty is not the first of the art, the earthworks. We've already seen them with the Mississippian people um, when we look at the Ohio Valley River um, serpent. And so this idea that we transform the natural environment um, for religious purposes already existed in indigenous America. So it makes sense that it represents that spiral that you see in the tail or the spiral shape that we see in this pictograph. Right? So how is it made? So the earthworks typically um, are made by, they're made by man and they're often made with using industrial materials. So like um, Jean-Claude and Christo, they would hire people. So Smithson got people to help him and they loaded trucks with those large rocks that we saw in the um, uh, video and then he had them dumped. And so they would dump them to create the jetty. Um, this is actually a website um, by two um, environmental um, art artists, um, Holt and Smithson. Holt is a woman who created, um, they, they kind of work like Stonehenge. She creates artworks that like are compasses. That's actually her work right there and uses industrial materials to kind of transform the natural landscape. And so I love this website because it really gives you an idea of um, different ways to experience these artworks since they're not in the traditional setting. Um, or in a, in a traditional setting of a gallery or a museum um, that you can get these kind of lovely um, aerial shots of them and how they change over time, um, even change during the time of day, right? With Holt's work, of course, it makes sense that it changes during the different times of day because they work like um, clocks, right? So let's go ahead and go back to our piece, right? So um, it took some time to get this to kind of build up into spiral. And then we have to think about how one would experience it. And since it's in a natural environment, it's probably best to understand um, that it changes over time. So at some times, the water level is really low, like what you saw in the video. And then, you know, so it's basically surrounded by salt and sand. And other times it's exposed and you can walk around it. And then other times it's under the water. So the meaning of this changes during the different seasons, during times of drought, during times of flooding. But initially, when the rock was exposed, we have to think about what it would be like if you were to walk on the spiral. Right? So you would be walking on a very bumpy path. So it's almost like this pilgrimage. It's not easy, right? It's not smooth. It's not clean. And you'd have to watch your step. So you would walk step by step, trying not to break your angle, um, your ankle. And you would walk step by step and you would focus on the spiral. And so that idea of focus in a way is like a meditation. Right. And so you might sometimes look up at the natural surrounding, but you would basically see the same thing over and over again as you went from the big circle to the medium sized circle to the smaller circle 
on the inside. And so one is supposed to experience it sort of as a meditation. And then of course, interesting enough, there's sometimes that you can't contemplate it on the actual jetty. You'd have to see it from a distance. You would, how many people see it, they take, um, uh, airplanes and they go and they fly over it and see it from an aerial view or other people drive there and just see it from the land. Um, this is um, double negative. It's actually not by Smithson. This one is actually um, in our textbook and of course I forgot his name. This is Michael Heisner. Um, and so they cut ravines into the land, right? And so it's almost like a little blip on the Google map. Right? The last piece is in the Unit 10, and we've already studied the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, but once again, it's probably important to understand that this too is site-specific work, um, and it's also environmental that it's cut into the natural hillside of the mall. Right, And so remember that the setting for this is very specific. It's placed in the mall in between monuments to Lincoln and Washington. And so remember that Mile Lynn um, a graduate school uh, student at Yale uh, won the design um, competition for this, and she used a um, black granite from India that's highly reflective so that one can see themselves when they see the name of deceased people who gave up their life um, in service to the country. And um, it's very meditative. Um, the black is very functional. Um, or um, is um, symbolic of the death, right? And that it's cut into the earth like a wound, right? Um, that it's like a slit into the environment. It's like a scar that will never heal. Right? And so it's in the ground. It's very quiet. It's very, very meditative. So when you go there, very few people speak. Here's some other pieces by Myelin. Right. The last artist that I have is Andrew, Gold, Andrew um, Goldsworthy, and he's a British artist who uses um, materials from the natural landscape to make artwork. So all of the materials that you see here, all of the leaves and all the rocks were found in the location, and then he carefully arranges them. And then, like many environmental artists, the documentation is basically how they sell their artwork. So he will take photos of his works. Um, he has a great movie, if you have time. I'm not sure if this is on Netflix or Hulu, but it's called Rivers and Tides. And so it's a beautiful movie. This makes it look a little bit dated, um, but this is just a little clip of it. It talks about this process. I shook hands with the place and begun. This is the last piece that we're going to look at, so if you don't have time, feel free to move on. It's really fun to watch his process. I wish I'd reached this point about an hour ago before the sun had risen. What, it, what is extraordinary that I didn't expect, but I would have, could only have dreamt of happening, is that the sun coming from there shines completely on both sides of the rock. So all the icicle is, is illuminated against that, that cliff. And I, I never had any idea that that would happen. So the potential, the potential here is fantastic. When I make a work, I often take it to the very edge of its collapse. And that's a very beautiful balance.
cups. Gotta learn from your mistakes. has a very meditative sort of quality to it. He sews all these leaves together to make the spiral. Very much like the spiral jetty. Oops, see it's little actually sewn together with like little needles from evergreen. Okay, there we go. All done for now.